another episode of this AI interview series. Today, we have a very, 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 very special guest, Christian Ortiz. And I'm so excited to be having this talk today. So before we begin about Christian, he's the CEO and founder of Justice AI. And he's also running this media group called Mode Atlas Media, where you can get amazing photography services, photo restorations, and cool digital designs and whatnot. And he's also acting as a global tech activist, which we are going to deep diver up, dive deeper a bit later. So welcome again, Christian, and thank you so much for being here and for your time. Thank you so much for having me, Jane. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. It's my honor, really. So again, back to you acting as a global tech activist. I really wanted to hear more about your journey, how you got here, what you do, and um, to promote especially equality and inclusivity, because I think it's such important, timely, and relevant topics for all, indeed. So can you share a little bit about you and what you do? For sure. And I agree with you completely. I think now more than ever, EDI or EDIB, as we're now calling it today, equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging mm -hmm. is just such an important thing to, to tackle. And a lot of corporations today and organizations and even creators online uh, seem to be having a little bit of an issue trying mm -hmm. to uh, navigate that world. And so as a solo entrepreneur, I am a multidisciplinary entrepreneur uh, that has been active in media for the last 20 plus years. Uh, and I built my mod brand. It's Mod Atlas Media. Uh, I built this brand off uh, several different types of industries from music to photography to um, entertainment. And I went full time uh, around 2019. I was working a corporate job for about five years in the South. And um, I had a high position in a credit card processing company. And I decided, you know what, I needed to take my my expertise and do my things, you know, by myself. And so around 2019, I started noticing AI becoming more prevalent. And um, by 2022, 2023, with the release of ChatGPT, I immediately knew how powerful AI not only is, but how big it's going to become. And so I took it upon myself to learn as much of it as I possibly can by jumping into AI in so many different levels from using ChatGPT to mm -hmm. uh, using it to create art and understanding how what kind of impacts it had in the art world. And so... I just understood immediately how powerful it was. But by using ChatGPT, I understood how extremely biased um, AI chatbots are. And so this, um, my thought process, uh, the way my mindset works is I always ask myself, what forms of intersectionality exist within my actions? And so um, blending my passion for social justice and with my media company, I knew that it was time to jump in with AI and to develop a new app if I could, figure out a way to deconstruct these things and incorporate my social justice work into artificial intelligence to see what I can do. And that's where Justice AI came from. Mm. Wow. That is indeed amazing. And I wanted to... Again, highlight that it is relevant to all of us because we are, you know, sooner or later, everyone is or will be using AI and will be impacted by the information it will be giving to us. So from how you see it, what can be done for our better awareness to tackle, for example, racism and social biases? Now, I know that there are more than one topic to be discussed in terms of this, but from my own experiences so far, I'm mostly on chat GPT more than any other platforms, but it has been quite thoughtful to me. Of course, it doesn't really have to know where I'm from, my gender and all that. Although I would assume, you know, based on some of the researches I read, it may be aware about my, you know, uh, you know, where I'm from, I'm female and things like that. 
Um, sure. But so far, I didn't quite feel the uncomfortableness with it. But on the other hand, uh, when I was using image generators, uh, including Dolly and some something else, there were more than one occasion where I, um, you know, where AI was confused about different cultural aspects of, you know, for example, different North's Asian countries. <laughs> so you cannot right. quite tell the difference between, and I, I would assume it happens quite frequently. It just gets to mix up different aspects or elements from different, you know, you know, data, not necessarily to come up with the exact cultural aspect you was looking for, you were looking for. So um, right. this was so far my experience, but there must be a vast, you know, other people number of people who are experiencing different things so how do we get to raise our own awareness to you know better utilize ai if this yeah, is the way so to put it it's a it's a fantastic uh question because right here in the chat we have big al gresswitz who's a good friend of mine and brian and they're both graphic designers and artists uh so hey gentlemen thank you for joining um they will tell you you know that that this has been a big hurdle in AI generative, generative art is trying to encapsulate cultures properly. I know me using it personally. Um, I have a uh, Chinese Canadian girlfriend and, and we take a lot of selfies and I try to recreate us on uh, apps like Mid Journey AI. And it always turns me Chinese as well or Asian. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, so it, it's interesting to see what it picks up versus uh, what we learn how to prompt, right? So mm. when we talk about prompting and understanding what we're telling these software to do, it's extremely important to be very mindful and cognitive of mm. what you are trying to achieve because there is a subtle difference between the power of something is ChatGPT, understanding your prompts and having Einstein intelligence to be able to understand what you're asking it for versus being hyper specific when you're typing in prompts for our, gener our generation. So um, when you're using things like Midjourney or Musafir AI, you have to be very, very mindful about what you're asking it to create and um, what, what you are looking to receive and I would just recommend for users out there to simply uh, keep trial and error, just keep doing and doing and doing and getting better with trying to ask and communicate better. Mm -hmm. And it gives us an opportunity to learn as well, right? As creators, if we're not getting what we are, um, yes, use Musavir AR AI, Big Al says, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful, um, app. They get they get those types of problems uh, right mm -hmm. very often. Okay, that is such an important point because oftentimes we get to think sometimes um, it's the platform itself that is needed to be improved. But from how you see it, it is also us. You know the necessity of the work we might want to put into, you know, for mindful prompts which I believe is, uh, an, which leads us to another discussion about Justice AI GPT. <laughs> <laughs> I discovered that recently Justice AI um, launched its own GPT, which I think is fascinating. It was there to help you come up with inclusivity prompts specifically. So this is, among others, a great tool to educate yourself to come up with, again, mindful prompt. So if any of you among audience is interested, please go ahead and sign up to chat and educate yourself a little um, surrounding this topic. So can you tell us a little about Justice AI GPT, if that's okay? Absolutely. So when I first stumbled upon just how, you know, we kept hearing this conversation of how biased AI actually really is. And when I started taking a look at it, I started thinking to myself, what does that actually mean? And how biased are we talking here? Mm -hmm. And so what I would do is I would use ChatGPT4 to run tests and ask it questions about topics that I was very well educated in. I am a social activist as well, have been for years. And so 
Um, I know stories about American history that, um, you know, the average American who doesn't dabble in, in politics or social justice may not know. And so I was able to ask it questions or ask it scenario, give it scenarios. And the answers that it would give me, it's hilarious because ChatGPT, uh, while although it's extremely knowledgeable, its responses reflect that of the perspective of a cisgender, heterosexual, white male living comfortably in America, right? So it often overlooks the diverse experiences and voices of marginalized communities. And so um, as I was identifying these biases in its responses, I would push back. I would actually argue with ChatGPT a little bit and say, hey, your response is very biased. You're missing these marks. And it would, it would understand and it would say you're absolutely correct. And so when OpenAI started releasing its own GPTs and made it available so that you can develop your own, I said, this is a perfect opportunity. Um, but it was more than just uh, developing an app that deconstructs biases. I had to really ask myself, what is the bigger picture? Because I'm not doing this performatively and I'm not just doing it because it's a hot topic and it's it sells and everybody it's popular. Like it really needs to have a massive impact and a purpose behind mm -hmm. the development process. And so of course, yes. I spent weeks and almost months really um, understanding what the purpose behind something like this actually would be. And so what I ultimately came to is developing an app that I could consult corporations and industry leaders mm -hmm. and C-suite executives who have potential um, issues within their HR departments, maybe their culture isn't as diverse as they want it to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so this provides a tool um, that deconstructs the perpetuation of familiar ways of being, mm -hmm. right? We as humans, we perpetuate familiarity, and that is just a natural human trait. But we have to prioritize what we are perpetuating. And we have to be mindful about the things that we are putting out into the universe because perpetuation is the antithesis of innovation. And so if we are to be innovators, if we are to look into the future, into becoming corporations and leaders and businesses that are going to really pave the way into a more equitable, more intelligent, more highly evolved society, then we really need to nip this in the bud as quickly as possible. And so... Mm -hmm. The, the beautiful thing about Justice AI is that it allows this to be a case by case um, situation where it's not just about developing a tool, it's about implementing it with people who are willing to make the change and willing to reform their structure uh, in within their corporations to be more equitable. Mm -hmm. And I believe you are the perfect person to be helping, you know, for example, corporates and other 11 parties to achieve this goal under EDI um, topic, because, you know, you do have corporate uh, work experience, but also um, you have been a creator for so long. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting when you're seeing AI. So, you know, I was watching this interview the other day and it was, you know, um, saying how sometimes ironic it can be because we used to think AI will be, you know, better at creative job at the last phase. Now, when we opened opened AI, it was exactly the opposite direction, right? It is being utilized in the creativity area the most. So how do you think is this topic relevant to you? Like how are you? Is it helping your work as a media uh, company owner? Um, and how are you innovating your company as a creator uh, utilizing AI? And I was also curious to hear, because you're so into you know, diversity, um, inclusivity, but not every single person is necessarily, right? How right. did you get, yeah, <laughs> I was really, really curious because I could see the passion and love for, you know, <laughs> to, you know, the try 
to include more people in this discussion uh, so that more people can be benefited from these services and whatnot. How did you get so passionate about these topics? I was wondering about that too. So about your creator you know, role and also about inclusivity. Absolutely. And th that's a fantastic question. It's so interesting to think about because it's something that I don't think about quite often. Um, I think the, the natural progression of where I am today stemmed from my upbringing and my family and in the time period that I grew in, grew up in. And I lived all around the country, uh, born and raised in Los Angeles, California, uh, raised in the 90s in New Jersey, you know, in a mob owned neighborhood and uh, lived in the South for 25 years. And what it did for me was it gave me perspectives from people who had who came from different walks of life. And so I have met and interacted with and befriended thousands upon thousands of people in my lifetime who um, come from different backgrounds and different have different understandings and uh, and being a natural born um, empath. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I relate to, to humans so much. And when we started collectively as a society going through this period of an awakening is what I call it. When, when mm -hmm. the society started becoming woke and we started going through this uh, tumultuous um, political climate here in the States, uh, it opened a lot of people's eyes with the Black Lives Matter movement and police brutality and stories of anti-Asian um, hate and mm -hmm. uh, Latinos started coming out. And so all of these non-traditional um, conversations started being had. And to answer your second part of your question about how it affects me, I think I'm gonna take that back into where it leads me professionally, is I think it impacted me personally first um, to hear the stories and have conversations mm -hmm. and even have conversations with individuals who don't think the way that I do due to their upbringing. And it was a lot of crucial conversations that I realized that we are not taught to have as a society in general. And so when you start understanding the backgrounds and where these individuals come from and why they think the way they do, you start to develop um, a broader sense of reality to be able to tackle these issues head on more and more. Uh, it, it actually helped me self-reflect on the way that, uh, speaking about my upbringing, I grew up in a very toxic household with toxic ideologies. And and it's not a boohoo me in, is, issue. We're all taught in different, you know, we're all given our households, but we, uh, we grew up with a lot of toxic ideologies that I had to deconstruct over the years. And so um, during that deconstruction, I realized that I was so passionate about it. I found myself being a social justice activist in the South. Um, during the Black Lives Matter movement, I was part of the Stacey Abrams campaign. I did social. I was able to incorporate my social media marketing with my business um, into these avenues. And so I started realizing that the intersection between business and social justice was a challenge. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the minute I start opening my mouth now, the people who don't want to hear what I have to say don't want to do business with me. And so it was a reality that was uh, was quite challenging. But it, I had to understand that as a business owner, we have to lead with conviction rather than our desperation for a dollar. Right. And so my I had to understand that my audience will be out there. The people who want to do business with me will do business with me. And the ones who don't don't. And that's OK, because I have to stick to my guns and I have to stick to my convictions. And so um, all of that came full circle when I finally made that decision to just lead and take the charge with what I believe. And knowing that my my mission behind all of it is um, strictly coming from the best morals that I can portray for mm -hmm. society, because I do want this society to be better. And I do want all my work to make positive impact. And in order to do that, you just have to be loud and unapologetic. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Wow. Uh, what a I journey. Know a lot. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about but, that. <laughs> well, you know, which leads me to asking this question how do we get to support you other than, you know, um, 
utilizing, probably utilizing Justice AI and promoting it to help your work? Yes. Um, so the best way to do it with the cheap, with the new GPTs, you have to be signed up to ChatGPT Pro for the newest version. So in order to use any new GPT, to my understanding, you have to have Pro. So if you don't have Pro, um, I don't know if it's four dollars a month. I, I don't know what the price is if you're paying it's, for Pro. I believe twenty something. Is it twenty? Yeah, twenty so, point something. Yeah, I'm I'm a pro user, uh, so it gets to charge every single month. But I, it definitely is worth it, I believe. I think because so too. The variety of GPTs now, including your one, <laughs> definitely worth it to try. Absolutely, just I'm always scary. on the hunt on LinkedIn to see who's got the newest one and what the, what are they doing, and <laughs> it's amazing to see what people are doing. And you know, this is. Um, this is a great tool uh, for your for your listeners to know if they're educators, if they're in the corporate world, um, no matter where you are, no matter what sector you work in, this tool will help better understand. It will help people better understand uh, the nuances and the sensitivities within cultures. And it, it can teach you how to better speak to individuals who don't look like you and to understand the plight and the struggles that people who have disabilities go through. Like when we talk about marginalized, it's just not people of color. It's women. It's people who have disabilities, people who are people of color with disabilities. Like it's a, it's such a great large window of opportunity to just understand a different perspective. Mm. But to, to your question, yes, how can you support? I think the best way is to go to my website, mm -hmm. which is www.modatlasmedia.com. Uh, and then you can just click on the Justice AI tab and it'll take you straight to the app from there. And it'll give you a how-to guide. You can see how you can use it depending on your industry. It's constantly being updated uh, with new information and new prompts and ways that you can use it that will benefit you because... You know, although this has uh, given me an opportunity to be a consultant and to educate other corporations, I want this to be in the hands of anybody who's just curious, because what I've ultimately found, and I'll kind of end this rant on this note, um, the best way for individuals to learn how to be a, the best ally they can in this fight is to find a safe space, a safe space where they can ask questions without being ridiculed, a safe space where they can um, ask questions and learn different perspectives uh, where they don't feel like they're going to be judged for asking something that they just don't know because fear is the fundamental root of this entire issue. You know, people fear the unknown. They fear um, the backlash. They fear, they fear so much. And so if I was able to provide a safe space for somebody to learn, I think this is it. This is the perfect space for it. Mm. Mm. What you just mentioned is such a crucial point. You know, we all need a safe space to, you know, sometimes when whenever we go through like situations we don't quite understand, we need support from or, you know, better judgment or, you know, understanding of this whole thing. You always need a safe space to talk to. And what you're trying to create and provide is this platform where people get to discuss about these situations, um, their uniquenesses, um, being respected and, and whatnot. So again, I really, really admire what you do. And you. if you have like uh, uh, two or three minutes, <laughs> this is you know my last question, which is actually about art. So yes. now I know that you're an empath and you have been creating a, a, a long time as a business owner. Um, yes. But I can see that you're also into helping people and also as an artist, because you know you have been creating. Um, I'm also personally into the topic of art. So would you ever consider probably, you know, um, continuing to create your own artwork in terms of you know, helping out the world, but also to to heal many people. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So I am the creative director of a portion of my business that I call Chico Man Art. And it, it goes back to a nickname that my brother gave me, who was also an artist. And oh. um, the purpose of my art that I do, I create a lot of digital paintings through Procreate and um, graphic design, but I also hand draw and paint as well. Uh, a lot of my subject matter focuses on highlighting and amplifying voices of people of color and also sharing their stories. So I do a lot of portraiture and I share the stories of people who have gone through things and have stories that need to be told. And so it's just another way that my, my work, my creativity intersects with my social justice. And I feel like it is a territory that a lot of people um, are afraid to go down just because of what comes with taking a stance with this kind of stuff but it's so important equally as well and i feel like if you can if you can create in a way that again becomes a safe space a, a place where people can just you can just open someone's eyes and and share a perspective that maybe they didn't even think about right through storytelling um then i think it, it all intersects and it, it all works well. And so to answer your question, I think that is the way that I do it. I think I, I, I choose to create imagery that helps educate people or maybe gets them a little more curious about uh, cultures or people that don't look like them or cultures they're not a part of. And, and I think it's a beautiful opportunity to do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you happen to have a website where we can see your artwork? Yeah, so it's also on Mod Atlas Media. There's a Chico Man Art tab, and so it's going to be on the very top. Um, you could see a lot of my artwork there, um, or on Instagram at Chico Man the Artist. Okay. What's your Instagram again, Chico? Oh, Chico Man. It's C H I C O M A N, and I believe it's underscore the and underscore artist. I believe. Okay. But if you do Chico Man art or Chico Man the artist, either way, it's all going to come out. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you so again much. for this fascinating talk. I've got to learn so much from, you know, this talk myself. So truly. Thank grateful. you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So before you go, anything you still wanted to share with our audience? I just really want to take a second to say thank you for this opportunity. I think this uh, initiative is extremely important. It's certainly dear to my heart. And I think that um, the more people that find out about it, I think the more they're going to be excited to, to actually deep dive into it and at least play around with the app. But mm -hmm. again, I'm just humble. I'm thankful. I'm grateful for this opportunity. And I just hope to continue to do the work that I do for years and years and years to come. Sure, sure. I really look forward to looking, you know, following your work moving forward. And one of the biggest things that I learned during this talk today is that I always thought that it's the platform, like it requires improvement, it needs to be fixed, things like that. Mm. But now I better understand that we also need to take the work and put in the work right. to better understand this technology and help it out further so that more people, more opinions are included. So thank you so much for that. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. And I will see you around on LinkedIn. Absolutely. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a great day.